Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to my talk about fuzzing with code fragments. So to start off, let's talk about fuzz testing. I guess most of you will know fuzz testing, how it actually works. But um, for those that don't, uh, fuzz testing just means, in a nutshell, that you take a program, you supply random input to the program, and then you check what happens. Or you check for abnormal behavior. For example, this could be a crash or an assertion. And this is very common to do in security industry, simply because once you have written a fuzzer, then it's very cheap to keep the fuzzer running on different versions of your product um, to find regressions. And also, fuzzers can find some very complex problems that you will probably not find manually. So of course, fuzz testing is not limited to the security scope. You can do fuzz testing for correctness as well, and you can use other oracles uh, than crashes or assertions, but that is out of scope of the presentation. So typical targets for fuzz testing are usually file formats, like documents. For example, take a Word document or uh, pictures, like you want to test a PNG decoder. Um, you can also fuzz network protocols, like an HTTP server or client implementation. And you can uh, fuzz interfaces. Like, for example, if you take a browser, then you have a document object model in there, and it provides a certain API. And you can randomly exercise that API and see what happens if something goes wrong. Now, there are lots of tools available for these types of fuzzing. At least for the first two one, for the third one, there is, to a certain extent, a, a tool chain available to do that. But what would you do now if you want to test an interpreter, like a language interpreter, which roughly consists of a parser and a runtime? Of course, I know that nowadays interpreters are much more complex, but for the sake of simplicity, we use this representation here. So what happens when you supply random input uh, to the parser is that this input will most likely be rejected simply because it does not follow the syntactic rules uh, that the interpreter expects you to follow. And that, of course, means that it's unlikely for you to get true to the runtime, where you could either get a successful run or maybe a crash. So of course, you could also get a crash in the parser stage already, but it's very unlikely that you'll find a lot of bugs in the parser stage, because it's not as complex as the runtime stage. Now, what you would actually need is you would need to generate random valid source code as the input for, uh, for the parser. And uh, if you would do that, then you would not be rejected anymore at the parser stage, at least if you're always following exactly the syntactic rules. That means you would, it, that it would be more likely to get you to the runtime. And then, of course, it's also more likely that you'll find crashes in the runtime. And our goal is to find crashes in the runtime. Now, you'll be asking yourself, why is this actually relevant? Well, you're using interpreters every day. For example, in your browser, there's at least one uh, very important interpreter, and that is the JavaScript engine of your browser. Most of the websites wouldn't even work with that, with that. So of course, there's also the question, why is the security relevant? So if you have a problem in the JavaScript engine, for example, a, a memory corruption, and you browse to a website that the attacker controls, then he can supply you a malicious JavaScript that exploits uh, the vulnerability, for example, to achieve code execution or information disclosure. Of course, the same thing also could happen if the attacker is an active network attacker and you're visiting any HTTP website. So you could, you, you could inject malicious JavaScript, for example, in there. And this is the main reason why we're using JavaScript as the primary language for, evalu for our evaluation later on. Now, possible approaches to solve the interpreter testing problem could be uh, to model the input using existing tools. But that is not, a, not such a good idea, simply because the existing tools, they don't aim to, to model language inputs. They are actually made to model block or stream formatted input, like you, you do use for pictures, for example. What you can always do is you can always write a custom fuzzer for your language. You can in, in actually write a custom fuzzer for pretty much everything. Um, but that would mean that, that the fuzzer is not generic, and you have a high amount of maintenance to keep the fuzzer up to date. If you add a feature to the language, or if you extend the language, then you will have to update the fuzzer too. So it's a very high amount of maintenance. And what you would actually want is a generic fuzzing framework for languages with low maintenance instead. And that is where our tool comes into play, which is called LangFuzz. And we aim to be as independent as possible from the target interpreter language. As independent as possible means that we have to make certain assumptions about languages. For example, uh, languages usually have identifiers and built-in functions, and we exploit this um, generic property of languages. 
We also wouldn't want to rely on the uh, source code of the target program simply because it extends the scope of possible testing. For example, if you would like to test Internet Explorer uh, as an outsider, then uh, that's, this wouldn't work if you would need the source code of the program. And most important property for me personally is that you can find defects in real-world programs. Because if I, if I would write such a tool, I wouldn't find any real-world defects and I would personally consider it useless. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the workflow of how Langfast works. So in phase one, you give Langfast a language grammar and a sample code and test suite, which are both written in the target language. In fact, these can even be identical. And um, in this phase, Langfast will learn code fragments from the sample code, and we'll see in a few how that works. In the second phase, uh, Langfast generates mutated tests using the test suite and in the third phase, uh, Langfast will run this mutated test in the interpreter and see what happens, for example, if there's a crash or an assertion. Now, in practice, you will, of course, not run the interpreter on every single test, like starting the interpreter, running the test, and stopping, for two reasons. The first one is, of course, performance. Starting and stopping interpreters is uh, very expensive. And uh, the second thing is that once, when, when you keep the interpreter running, you have a chance that the tests influence each other by chance. And that is something you would like to have for fuzzing because it uh, en enlarges the possibilities that you, that you have uh, to find bugs. Now let's have a look at how the, uh, how the learning step actually works. So Langfast takes the sample code and then uses the grammar to actually check which code fragments the sample code is made of. And code fragment here means a node in the grammar. For example, an expression or a, a Boolean expression or an if statement, something like this. And then Langfast takes all these code snippets and memorizes what kind of types they have and store it in, stores it in memory. Now the code mutation step starts similarly. Uh, Langfast looks at the test at, at, a, at a single test case using the grammar. It determines uh, what syntactic elements this uh, test case is made of. And now it randomly picks certain code fragments in there and tries to replace them with different code fragments. So either it uses known code fragments from the sample code that we have just learned, or it uses a generational algorithm um, that, that, it, uh, that uses the grammar to generate uh, syntactically valid elements. Now, I'm not going into detail how the generational algorithm works, so it's not really very complex. If you want to have a look at that, it's in the paper described in detail. And of course, a very important property about this replacement is that the replacement is, of course, made uh, such that the syntax is not broken, because that is our actual goal. So we are respecting the syntax types here. We don't want to introduce syntax errors, because otherwise we would be rejected again at that early stage in the parser, which is what we try to avoid. And, um, the, and afterwards, of course, we will get the mutated test out of this that we can later run in the interpreter. Now, the good thing about this is that we can locate incomplete fixes and new defects. So incomplete fixes is probably more straightforward. If the test case is a regression test for a certain bug that you think it is, is fixed now, if you make a slight modification, it might be that you hit the same bug again because the fix was incomplete. And we've seen that a few times happening in practice. And the second uh, thing is that we believe that for regression tests, um, they contain certain code fragments that are likely to trigger abnormal behavior in general in the engine. So that is why we think that taking test cases, especially regression tests, as a starting point for mutation is a good idea. Now let's have a look at the evaluation of the tool because we believe that evaluation is a very important uh, thing when writing such a tool. So the first evaluation step that we want to take is, uh, is a comparison of state of the art. And for that purpose, we will have to compare the state of the art. So what is that? So a colleague of mine, uh, Jesse Ruhrmann, uh, wrote JS Funfast in 2007, and that is a parser for JavaScript, which found over 1,000 bugs in Mozilla's JavaScript engine. So that is really a, a huge number. And he also found bugs, of course, in other JavaScript engines. And it's also highly specialized on JavaScript features. So you can find very complex problems in corner cases of the JavaScript specification. The downside is, of course, if you want to test a different language or if you want to test new language features that are added to JavaScript, for example, if Harmony features, which is the successor of JavaScript, are added, then you will, of course, have to change the fuzzer. And the second thing is that it only produces what it was programmed for. So if you forgot a certain area in a JavaScript specification, then you will never test it. 
Now, in order to compare with state of the art, the first thing that we want to look at is the overlap. So what amount of defects are found by both tools? So you would expect that the overlap is not zero. That would be kind of strange. But it would be good if the overlap was not 100%, because that would mean we can find any new bugs that js fast cannot find already, which would make the tool much less useful. And the second thing that you would like to look at is uh, effectiveness. So how many defects per time unit can both tools find? So you would expect that uh, a tool that is more generic uh, is less effective, but you would like to know also how, how, much is that, uh, how much is the effectiveness compared to the other tool. Now, in order to evaluate these two things, we came up with a, an experimental setup where we use a JavaScript grammar for LangFuzz, and we use the code base from Mozilla uh, to provide the test suite and the sample code and the interpreter that we run to test uh, the mutated JavaScript we generate. The question is now, though, which version of Firefox would you use here for testing? Would you just pick a random version here? That's not going to work. The, the main reason why that is not going to work is uh, JS FunFuzz is part of the development process. That means there are continuously bugs being detected and fixed during the development process because JS FunFuzz is continuously run every day on Firefox. So what, why is that a problem? If you take a look at the version control system and um, you take a look at the life cycle of a single bug that is found due to JS FunFuzz, then at some point the bug is introduced, JS FunFuzz detects the bug, and at some point it's fixed. And this happens all the time during the development process. Now, if you take a, a random revision here and perform the experiment with both tools, then all of these bugs are essentially missed because JS FunFuzz cannot detect bugs that are already fixed uh, by then. So that would, if, if we would do this kind of experiment, then we would bias the results towards our own tool. And that is certainly something we would like to avoid. Now, in order to solve this problem, uh, let's have a look again at the life cycle of a single bug. And what we can do now is we can start off with a revision A and then search through the revisions, um, checking for the next fix that was made due to JS FunFuzz being part of the development process. And right before that, we stop and call that revision B, and now we have a testing window. And this window has the property now that we have no fixes in there that were made due to JS FunFuzz being part of the development process. Now, how do we actually find that? So if we can find A, from A we can find B through log mining. That works because Mozilla records every single fix that was made due to JS FunFuzz, so we have all the bug numbers. That were, that were associated with JS FunFuzz, and the bug numbers, again, are in the commit messages, so we can do a, a mining here to, to see which commits are actually related to JS FunFuzz fixes. And once we have that, we can run both tools on revision B. But we cannot simply use all the defects that both tools find now. We must check that the defects were actually introduced in the window here and ignore all the defects that were, previous, that were introduced before the revision A here. Because if we would not ignore these, then LangFast would again find more bugs because the bugs that are before A, they are already fixed because, again, JS FunFast was part of the development process. In order to find out where the bug was introduced, we used uh, bisection and we used information from the bug report, so that information was often readily available. And, of course, also a single testing window is probably not enough for evaluation, so you can repeat this step a few times to find large testing windows that you can use for your experiments. And that is actually what we did. So we did uh, experiments based on five testing windows. On each testing window, we ran both tools 24 hours. And these testing windows were so large that they cover roughly two months of development. That's quite a, quite a bit of time in development. And it turns out that JS FunFuzz found 15 defects, while LangFuzz found eight defects, and three of these defects were found by both tools. That gives us an overlap of 15%. That's not, not much and an effectiveness of 53%. That means JS FunFuzz roughly finds twice as many bugs as LangFuzz does in the same time. And we think that this is a low overlap with an affordable performance. If you think about that, the LangFuzz approach is a generic approach, while JS FunFuzz is a, a highly language-specific approach. Now, what we also see here is that LangFuzz finds, finds a certain amount of bugs that JS FunFuzz did not find, and the question is, why is that? Which methods in LangFast account for that? And that's why we decided to also do an internal comparison. What we would like to compare internally is 
uh, which of the techniques is, uh, is important. For example, we have this code generation step. Is it even necessary? Could we just make the algorithm simpler, throw away the code generation step, and only use the known fragments? In order to determine that, we tested the two most defect-prone revisions from previous experiments, three days, and we performed two runs. The first one was with all code generated, so we only used the code generation algorithm, and the second one was without any code generation. And it turns out that on both windows, we have bugs that were only found in one or the other configuration. That basically means that both techniques are required, and they both contribute to uh, the overall result. So you cannot just omit any of the techniques to get the same result. Now the next evaluation step that we took is the field test with Mozilla and Google. That is one of my favorite experiments, actually. <laughs> Uh, so what we did is we took, again, the, the experimental setup um, that we used before. But as a software, we used Mozilla TraceMonkey Firefox 4 Beta during development. So the code was evolving here. Um, we also used Mozilla Type Inference. That was an experimental branch at that time. But right now, if you're using Firefox, that is in all of your uh, versions now that you're using, probably. Uh, and we also used Google V8. At that time, it was Chrome 10 Beta. And of course, as I said, the code was evolving during that time. We ran this for, for, for a large amount of time to see what happens if you put LangFast into the development process. And the results were that within four months, we found 51 defects on Mozilla Trace Monkey. 20 of those were security related, and nine were duplicate to non LangFast defects, for example, JS FunFast. And the classification for security related here was made by the developers. So we, made, we reported every single bug in Bugzilla. To the developers, we asked the security team and the developers to make a security rating, and that's how we come up with the 20 security-related bugs here. On Mozilla Type Inference, we have uh, 54 bugs in one month and four duplicates to non-Langfast defects. And on Google V8, we have 59 bugs in one month and 11 security-related defects, and we have no duplicate information there. Now you will ask yourself, why has Mozilla Type Inference no security problems here? It's simply because there is no classification made by the developers. Uh, it was an alpha branch, and um, there is no security classification made for alpha branches because it's not necessary for the security life cycle. And now for the last evaluation strategy. So if we claim that the, the, that the technique is actually language independent, then we should at least try it out in another language too to see if this is not something that is JavaScript specific. And we decided uh, to do an experiment with PHP. So we took uh, PHP grammar instead and put it into LangFast. And we used PHP shell as it was in trunk at that time. And we ran this for two weeks, and we found 18 bucks, mostly memory corruptions, garbage collector problems, and so on. So according to, to the security model of PHP, if they have any, uh, then these bugs are not actually security bugs because providing arbitrary code, even if you use all the security features of PHP, is not within the security model. But it's not actually that important. It's just that we can see that the technique works on PHP. If you embed PHP into some untrusted environment, don't do that. Now, last question that you will probably ask is, can you use LangFast really on any language? Well, you can, but... If you use, for example, a language that uses static typing, for example, Java, C++, C, then this will most likely give poor results, simply because LangFast is not aware of types or a type system, and you will most likely not even generate code that compiles. So you will never get the, to the runtime stage here. Of course, you could think about future work to improve the understanding of types in LangFast or introduce something to make that work better, and then it might work even on these languages. But overall, um, this won't work. And the second thing that you will have to think about is you need a good amount of tests and examples that you can work with. For example, Mozilla has 3,000 JavaScript regression tests, and PHP has only 300, I think. So that's a factor of 10, and I think that is one of the reasons why the performance on PHP was still lower compared to the performance uh, on Mozilla. So overall, we can say that it works best on dynamically, weakly typed languages when you have lots of tests available. And that completes the evaluation that we did for the tool. Now, overall, we, we have introduced uh, the problem that we want to do random testing on a language interpreter. And uh, we have introduced our tool that helps to solve this approach in a generic way. 
we did a lot of experiments both on JavaScript and also on PHP, and we presented uh, that we can find a lot of real-world defects in, in, in existing software. And in fact, uh, I got 18 Chromium Security Awards and 12 Mozilla Security Bug Bounty Awards in only nine months. And that number is increasing, at least for the Chromium uh, software, not because Firefox doesn't have security vulnerabilities, but they don't want to give me any more uh, security bug bounty awards since I got employed. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So the code that you create, um, if it goes through the, um, what's the second stage? The, the, parser, sta or the parser stage or the runtime? Sorry? The parser stage or the runtime stage? Yeah, the runtime. If it goes through the runtime, yeah. um, it could still have uh, bugs in the, yeah, okay. Sorry? Yeah, what I'm trying to say is it's possible that you feed code to the runtime and the runtime doesn't crash, but it doesn't produce correct results, right? That is perfectly valid. So you cannot, with this approach, you, you can actually do correctness testing, but you would need a second oracle to tell you if the code is cor working correctly or not. So if you just take a single engine, feed code into it, and it says error, some, some error, then you don't know if that is supposed to be co correct or not, because the code is not meaningful. A crash or a search and always means that something is wrong, but ha just getting, for example, a runtime error doesn't tell you anything. But if you, you can actually use this tool even for correctness testing, if you have a second engine, a second implementation, for example, if you take Mozilla and Google side by side and you feed the same code into both, and you can observe if they behave the same, and if both throw a runtime error, then it's probably correct, but if one throws a runtime error and the other doesn't, then it's probably a correctness bug. So you can find correctness bugs with that, but you need, of course, an oracle that tells you what is correct and what not. So the code is not meaningful. It's not meant to produce no errors, and you cannot tell if it behaves correctly. That's exactly right. And do you know if there are any tools that do that? Uh, but uh, I'm actually interested in tools that don't compare based on another uh, reference um, interpreter, tools that, have, uh, that produce the correct result mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you run the code through your runtime, and your your reference is the tool itself. Yeah. So, for for language independent tools, uh, I don't really know any tool. But for example, JS Funfuss or any custom tool can be written like that. JS Funfuss was written such that it does not produce errors, or if it produces an error, it knows that it should produce an error. So JS Funfuss found quite a few correctness bugs even. So I guess you will have to stick to specific tools simply because it's very hard to come up with a with a tool that is very far away from the specific implementation, but still knows what is correct and what not. I see. OK, thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, when you ask questions, please introduce yourself, like name and affiliation. Uh, I guess I have a question. Uh, so you, you talked about what kind of languages you can, you can support in LangPuzz. Mm -hmm. Did you look at uh, macro languages, which are Especially macro languages uh, whose syntax depends on, on previous interpretation of the language, like, like LaTeX style. So no, no, we haven't actually do that, and I think uh, in the current design it's not supported because the, the the syntax here is static; it's supplied as a grammar, um, and the syntax cannot change during uh, during the tool run. So that is, will most likely not work. But with a different design approach, you could probably achieve something like that too. Let's thank the speaker.